are you suffering right now? What can you do about it? Those are the questions the Buddha has you ask. Suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path to its cessation, these are the Buddha's truths, not his own personal truths. These are the only ones that he gave the word noble truth to. In other words, these are standard all across the board. And all of his teachings are centered around these issues. We know this, we've heard it many times, that the Buddha said all he teaches is suffering and the end of suffering. And yet you look in the books and there seem to be so much more. And people are often tempted to try to create a systematic philosophy out of what the Buddha taught. But there are basically different approaches to these two issues, how to understand suffering, how to put an end to it. Everything else, he said, is a personal truth, the things that strike you as true because of the particulars of your experience. But those particulars keep changing, and your idea of what's true out there, or what's true in here, can change. But the nature of suffering itself, that doesn't change. There are particulars about how and why you're suffering at a particular moment, but the actual fact of the suffering, that's something that's standard across the board. And it's the one issue, say, that scientists can't answer. They can account for all kinds of things. They can map the brain, see which parts of the brain serve as pain centers, talk about how the nervous system reacts to pain. But the actual experience of pain, how it feels. That's something they can't account for. And so from the Buddha's point of view, a lot of what they have to say is beside the point. The real question is, what is the direct experience of pain, suffering, stress? What causes it? And you ask what causes it, so you can put an end to the cause and then put an end to the stress. It's almost as if the Buddha's whole life was an experiment. He says, suppose that there is an end to suffering. What would that mean? And he worked out all the implications of that hypothesis. And he found that it worked. This is why his truths carry duties or tasks. They're not simple statements about reality. Or attempts to describe reality. They're pointers that involve tasks. Whenever anything issue comes up in your life, ask yourself, where is the suffering right now? Try to comprehend it. see that there is a difference, say, between physical pain and the mental suffering that goes along with it. You're focusing on the mental suffering. That's the real issue. It's like the watering hole in the, in the middle of a desert or a savanna. All these animals start coming to the hole. And so watch there at the pain, at the suffering, see what else comes around it. See what arises together with this, the suffering and the pain. That's what one of the meanings of samudhya, or origination, the things that come together with the suffering. And you find that the two important ones are craving and ignorance. And try to identify exactly what's the craving here right now. And often it's for a particular type of pleasure, because for most of us that's our only knowledge of how to get away from pain. 
And when you look at pleasure, though, what does pleasure have to offer? It comes and it goes very quickly. Before you can even catch hold of it, it's gone. It's like when you have your nose really close to a cold window pane and you breathe out and you see the, the fog on the window pane. Before you can even determine what shape that, that little patch of fog takes, it's gone. And then we think we can kind of try to catch hold of it. Of course, in the act of catching hold of it, what have you got? You've got clinging. You cling to the memory, say, of the pain, or you cling to the ant excuse me, cling to the memory of the pleasure. Cling to the anticipation of the pleasure, and you also tense up around the pain, the memory and the anticipation of the pain. And so much of our lives is centered around this issue of trying to run after pleasure, finding it one way or another, in relationships, in things, in positions in society. All these things we do for that little tiny taste of pleasure. And the problem is that it is so little and so tiny, and yet there's so much other work that goes into it. This is one of the reasons why we tend to not be very honest with ourselves about what our purpose is, say, in a relationship. Because if we ask yourself, well, it was just for that little bit of pleasure, well, there's an awful lot of effort that goes into this. And it seems beneath us. So we deal in all kinds of abstractions to justify what we're pursuing in a particular relationship or in a particular activity. But if you put yourself where you can, in a position where you can be honest about it and you see it, you begin to realize there's an awful lot in life that's not worth the effort, all these fleeting pleasures that we chase after. It's not nearly enough reward for all the effort that goes into trying to freeze them, solidify them to the point where you can actually grasp at them grasp hold of them. And of course it never really works. They just keep slipping through your grasp. And what you're left with is the the tension of the grasp, the tension of the clutching hand. It tries to hold on to these things. And that of course leads to more suffering. So it's when you can finally look at this and see this for what it is. That's when you're in a position where you can really apply the path. In fact, the seeing of the process is the beginning of the path. You begin to get a little bit of disenchantment with the craving. As long as you're not disenchanted with craving, it's hard to practice the path. It's hard even to get on the path. But seeing the suffering and seeing the problems that come along with it, that's what gets you on the path, even though it, you don't fully comprehend the suffering at that point yet, and you haven't really let totally let go of the craving, at least you begin to see the drawbacks. That in, it, in itself is a beginning of right view. And then we follow all the other factors of the path, particularly right concentration, which is the practice that gives the mind the strength it needs in order to pull away from the craving, to pull out of its old habits. So after all, the, the mind needs pleasure, so you give it the pleasure of concentration. 
once it has the pleasure of concentration as a point of comparison, then it can look at all the other pleasures that it's been running after, and it can be really frank about their drawbacks, honest about their drawbacks. And it's that honesty that allows you to let them go. Until all you have left is the, the attachment to the path itself. The attachment to the pleasure that comes from right concentration. And then you work on letting go of that. And that's what frees you. This is how the Buddha proved to himself that his approach was right. It is possible to put an end to suffering. And these four truths are the only ones that you have to take as totally absolute, totally true. Of course, the released mind goes beyond these truths as well, but as long as you're here in the midst of suffering, these are the only ones you have to hold on to, give your trust to as being absolutely certain. As for whatever other issues may come up in the mind, you know, view them as provisional. Those aren't the real issues. No matter how real and insistent they may seem, you have to learn how to put a little question mark next to them, and then break them down into these issues, Four Noble Truths. Because the Four Noble Truths are so well known and so basic, we forget how radical they are. But if you learn how to use them in a radical way, they can really show their power. It's like a solvent that dissolves a lot of other issues. It helps keep us on the right track, helps keep us from getting distracted and led astray, weighing our minds down with all sorts of unnecessary theories and questions and ideas. and. Guesswork. And focusing on the immediate issue. What is the suffering right now? What are you doing that's aggravating the suffering? Can you stop? What does you what do you need to do in order to stop? Those are the questions you can apply to any issue at any time. And they're focused directly on your own experience, the part of your own experience that nobody else can know. This is why the Buddha said it's bachatang, it's individual. Universal in its truth, but very individual and very direct in how you're experiencing it right now. Which is why the truths are also open, I go, pertinent, relevant all the time. They're always there to put to use. They're always there to depend on. So don't ever, don't ever let yourself think that you're left adrift without a compass. When things seem confusing, things, things seem chaotic in life, fall back on these truths, and they'll show you the way out.